Yeah, if, if you walked in, this was like the sitting area. So you could sit down like and wait for the nurse to come and get you and take you upstairs. So this is the uh, entrance. I used to go in there and sit on the chair, and I was only a little girl. So I'd sit there and swing my legs back and forth and watch the people come in. And I'd envy all the nurses and doctors that came in because they always looked so professional and so cool. And so that's where I think I got my interest in the medical profession, was watching all of the nurses and doctors, you know, running back and forth in the hallways at the hospital. And I was very little. Um, I first went there when I was four years old for surgery. And as soon as I was able to, we lived like right behind the hospital, my, our house. So it was just a matter of a minute's walk to get in the front door. When I was old enough to walk by myself, I used to go up there and just sit and watch the, the, all the medical people going back and forth. And, you know, they're hurrying, they're rushing, they're looking important. When you first were going there, do you know the type of uniform that the nurses had? Oh, absolutely. It was, um, they had to wear white pantyhose, um, a white dress that came down almost to the mid-calf. They had to wear three-quarter length sleeves, and they wore their nurse's cap, of course, and white nurse's shoes. And you know, you could spot them in a blink of an eye. But the doctors are always cool because they came in with a suit and a tie and their white lab coats on, and then they had a bunch of junk in their pockets. These were the old-fashioned kind of lights, but you can see how they were like, had a gooseneck to them, so the doctors could pull them down, pull them up, if they wanted to look in somebody's nose or ears. Um, let's see, I was four years old, so it was 1960. I was admitted to have my tonsils and adenoids taken out. My mom worked at the um, entrance desk where the switchboard was, back when you had to pull the cord out and click it into the little hole so you would connect it to the phone upstairs, like in the PG unit or the delivery room. And um, she, so you walked in the door and she was exactly directly to the right as soon as you walked in. 1950s and 60s was just when people were getting away from dying at home. And because even in the 50s sometimes, the older folks thought going to the hospital meant certain death. And they wanted to die at home, like my father's mother did, of uterine cancer, surrounded by their family in their own bed, in their own home, instead of with all strangers, all dressed in white, and you couldn't tell one face from another. And the final level of stairs, going to the roof. And here's everybody. the nursing home area or the nurses quarters so this is the community room where sick people were when there was an epidemic or an outbreak and they would bring them all in here. And now, the floor is breaking, and there's moss on this bed. Back then, they didn't have private or semi-private rooms. I mean, they did, usually for a very contagious disease. You were put in a ward where maybe there was up to 10 or 12 beds, and privacy was very minimal, and they didn't have urinals for the gentlemen to use. You had, they had to get up and walk in the bathroom for privacy. I was up in the pediatric floor for my tonsil, and there was no air conditioning, of course. Oh, so when it was... hot. Yeah, it was real hot. And they had the windows open, and I remember one patient had a tracheotomy to breathe and stuff, and a fly got in there and laid eggs, and then there were maggots coming out of the little throat to the 
freaky out of the tube because there was no window screens. But they would put the windows up because it was 90 degrees and hot and try to get a breeze in there. And so all the bubbles would come in. In the basement, they had laboratory animals in cages, like little mice and stuff. And um, it was so cool because there was a really strict ironclad nurse down there that watched all the animals. She didn't do the research on them or whatever, but she was in charge of, you know, keeping them and cleaning them and feeding them, cleaning out their cages. And Linda and I would, it was in the basement, so Linda and I would sit there and kneel on the ground to look in the windows. And once in a while, when she left the door open, when it was a hot day, we were able to walk in the door and sneak in the room, the laboratory room, where all the lab breaths were and everything, and check them all out. Hold on my right side. There's a hold on my left side. Okay. Am I just gently? Don't jump. No. Just gonna step. Just gonna do it. Okay, so we have the hospital hallway. We have hospital bed and a toilet over there. We got John taking a picture. And what do we have John taking a picture of? That. Hey, that's room 22, man. <laughs> room 22 is just gone. Yeah, room, tw hey, room 22 there is, is just down there. There's no room 22 no, anymore. No. Room 22 converged with room 11. <laughs> <laughs> which pancaked into the basement, which is now... So it's like room negative 33. Oh yeah, and there's the chimney thing in the back. I used to walk around it to get to the windows to where the dietary kitchen was in the basement because my sister, who was 10 years older than me, she was, she was like 17, 18, when I was 7 or 8, she worked down there in the kitchen, and so did this other teenager guy, and I had the biggest crush on him, and... I would make this little, you, I, he couldn't hear me, you're not, and I wasn't allowed to knock on the window. So I'd make this little sign on a piece of paper that said, Hi Pete! And I would just sit there with the paper, holding the paper up to the window, waiting for him to glance around. And then he was, oh, hi Bridgie! And me and Linda, who were the same age, and her brother Doug, who was about a year younger than her, we were like three musketeers. Before TV and everything, we had to, yeah, make do with what we could amuse ourselves with. We were urban explorers. Every time somebody moved out of the house and there was no, there were no relatives to claim it or put it for sale or move in, we would be there with our flashlights and Doug would have his machete and we just loved living in empty houses. We would walk all over town trying to find some place where somebody moved out. But when I was four, I had my tonsils that night to take out and they were all white steel cribs, you know, the old fashioned kind. And um, in those cribs next to me, was so close, they were packed in there so tight, was a little girl about my age who had polio. And it was a disaster back then. You know, it was so contagious and so violent of a disease for a child to come down with. And her legs were paralyzed, but thank God she didn't have to go in an iron lung. We would sit there, and at night, after they turned out the lights, we were kind of afraid, and we would reach out and hold each other's hands through the crib rail. 